you, Dr. Joshi. So, very good afternoon to one and all who has joined into today's meeting. And as there's a very popular saying which goes like, you cannot reinvent the wheel. The wheel is already there, but you can, of course, improve the way that the wheel spins on the ground. And I think the same applies to Akarbos. Akarbos has been there with us for nearly a quarter of a century, and it has proven its effectiveness and safety time and again. We cannot reinvent a carbos, but we can look back at some of the evidence generated over the last two years to improve our confidence in the use of a carbos. And I'll talk about the last couple of years' publication with regard to its mechanism of action, its efficacy, its effect not only on A1C, but also on parameters of glycemic variability. Importantly, its effect on inflammatory markers and, of course, the cardiometabolic effects of the use of a carbos. Now, we know that when we talk of alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, their predominant mechanism of action is delaying the postprandial carbohydrate absorption, delaying postprandial blood glucose rise. But it's interesting to note that when we talk of acarbose, it has been proven time and again that beyond inhibiting the absorption of glucose, it also alters the gut microbiota, and it also increases postprandial levels of GLP-1 by pushing more polysaccharides to the distal gut. In 2021, earlier this year, this was a paper which reconfirmed the fact that a carbose, unlike the other alpha glucosidase inhibitors like boglibose, has an additional effect on blood glucose by increasing the postprandial GLP-1 level. Now, we know that mechanism of action is good, but at the end, you have to prove your efficacy. Now, this was an interesting study published from China in 2019 which included about 670 newly diagnosed patients with diabetes and divided them into three groups. One with good beta cell function, the other with medium beta cell function, and the third with poor beta cell function. And they gave metformin or acarbos to all these three groups of patients. Now, after follow-up, it was found that both metformin as well as acarbos was equally good in terms of reducing blood glucose levels. But when it came to reducing body weight and central obesity, particularly in the poor beta cell function group, acarbose was better than metformin. Acarbose was also better than metformin in improving triglyceride levels, particularly in those with medium and poor beta cell function. Now, as I discussed a short while ago, acarbose has this unique property amongst AGIs of increasing postprandial levels of GLP-1. It also has an effect on inhibiting levels of gastrin and increasing levels of peptide YY and other impretins. The end result of which is that it improves satiety as well and it leads to decrease in body weight much better than other groups, other drugs in its class. With regard to decrease in triglyceride, again, we know that use of a carbos reduces postprandial hyperinsulinemia which in turn inhibits hepatic triglyceride synthesis amongst one of several mechanisms because of which acarbose improves triglycerides as well. Now, instead of comparing acarbose with metformin alone, let us look at a bigger picture. And we get this bigger picture from a trial published in 2020, which included over 3 lakh patients with diabetes and over 540 trials and all the anti-diabetic agents that we know of. It was seen that if you compare the drugs as monotherapy, they are all more or less similar in terms of blood glucose control, including acarbose, with the exception of gliptins, which are somewhat inferior to other classes of agents when you compare them as monotherapy, not as, as on add-on on metformin. As add-on to metformin, it was seen that the injectable agents had somewhat superior efficacy, including insulin and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, Amongst the oral agents, all drugs, including acarbose, was, were acting similarly in terms of reducing HbA1c. And this is not an isolated meta-analysis. A similar meta-analysis in 2015 had shown that acarbose is as good as any other agent that there is in terms of reducing A1c. And we know that particularly in Eastern population, Asian populations who take a lot of carbohydrate, acarbose has far superior efficacy compared to Western populations. Now, when we talk of using a carbos, the main competitor, I think, which comes to mind is a DPP-4 inhibitor because they are similar in a number of aspects. 
Acarbose as well as DPP4 inhibitors have beta cell independent action because of which they have a durable action. They do not cause hypoglycemia per se. But the area where Acarbose trumps a DPP4 inhibitor or has better data is with regard to weight loss, where time and again studies have shown that Acarbose causes weight loss, whereas DPP4 inhibitors as a class are weight neutral. And this again is a trial published last year, which reconfirms the fact that if you use a carbose, particularly in patients who have obesity, you have an edge over the things because it reduces body weight as well. But what often happens is that we get patients who are already on, say, a metformin and a glyptin and are not doing well. What then if you add a carbose on top of it? So this was a study published in 2019 in Korean patients who were already on cetagliptin and metformin, but they were not well controlled. It was seen that if you added a carbose on top of cetagliptin and metformin, instead of continuing it, you, get, you got better glucose control, additional A1C reduction to the tune of around 0.4.5%, which reconfirms the fact that in, in patients who are already on a DPP4 inhibitor and metformin, if you add a carbose, you add another agent which doesn't cause hypoglycemia per se, but reduces blood glucose levels even better. What was interesting was the fact that the study investigators also tried to look at the levels of insulin and the levels of glucagon after the addition of a carbose on top of metformin and cetagliptin. It was interestingly found that while the levels of insulin did not increase further, the level of glucagon decreased further after addition of a carbose on top of metformin and cetagliptin. We know that when we use a drug like a carbose, we increase GLP-1 levels, which have an effect on reducing postprandial glucagon levels. And this was what was borne out in this study, giving us further confidence in the fact that when you are using a drug like a carbose, you have an additional bonus effect of increasing GLP-1 levels, reducing glucagon levels, which reduces blood glucose safety and effectively. Now, in the recent past, we have seen a resurgence of the use of non-sulfonylurea C-fetagogues like repaglinide. Now, in terms of efficacy, how good are they? In terms of safety and reduction in glycemic variability, how good is repaglinide? This was a study where repaglinide and metformin in one arm was compared with the use of acarbose and metformin in the other arm. Both agents were used three times daily in patients with type 2 diabetes. It was seen that in terms of glucose control, both agents were similarly good. Both the agents reduced blood glucose from the baseline effectively and equally. However, when it came to improvement of glycemic variability, acarbose had a clear edge over the non-secretagogue uh, non sulfonylurea secretagog, that is repaglinide. So when you consider a carbose over repaglinide, you get equally good glucose control, and importantly, you improve glycemic variability much better than you do using repaglinide. I think there are two other facts where a carbose would trump repaglinide. One would be the fact that repaglinide is dependent on beta cell function. A carbose is independent of beta cell function. So there is no a carbose failure per se, but there can be repaglinide failure. And of course, a carbose would have much longer durability than the than repaglinide. The second benefit would be that a carbose per se never causes hypoglycemia. Whereas with the use of repaglinide, although it's short acting, hypoglycemia has been noted in a number of trials. Now, when, talk, when we talk of glycemic variability, so the group of patients in whom it is possibly the most difficult to reduce glycemic variability are patients with long-standing diabetes, patients who are on insulin. So this was an interesting study published in 2020 November, which tried to look at the effect of adding either a carbose in one arm or metformin in the other arm in improving glycemic variability in patients who were on premixed insulin twice daily. It was found that use of a carbose reduced parameters of glycemic variability like CV, MAGE, as well as ST, much better compared to the use of metformin. And again, we know that in patients who are on premixed insulin with long duration of diabetes, reduced beta cell function, there's a lot of glycemic variability. So even in this population, a carbose was doing better than metformin in terms of reducing parameters of glycemic variability. 
It was not only glycemic variability where acarbose did better compared to metformin in patients of weaning stinson, but also in terms of reducing body weight better, in terms of improving the blood pressure and improving the conventional parameters of glucose control, that is fasting, postprandial glucose, and A1C, that acarbose showed superiority to metformin in patients on preemic stinson. I think the message should not be that you use acarbose in preference to metformin in all patients. You can consider acarbose in patients who are intolerant to metformin, even otherwise in patients on metformin, on metformin plus a gliptin, you can always consider acarbose because of its benefit in reducing glycemic variability besides its sure shot action in reducing blood glucose levels. Now, we have looked at the metabolic benefits of using acarbose, reduction in body weight, glucose variability, blood glucose levels. But what about improvement in cardiovascular risk factors and improvement in cardiovascular disease? Now, this was a study published in 2020, which included patients from Iran, Iranian patients with metabolic syndrome. And they were put on a carbose and over a period of six months, several cardiovascular surrogate risk factors were monitored like the carotid intermobidial thickness, flow mediated dilation and epicardial fat thickness. It was found that with the use of a carbose, there was a significant improvement in all these surrogate cardiovascular risk markers, surrogate markers for cardiovascular disease. There was reduction in CRP, intermomedial thickness, epicardial fat thickness, besides an improvement in body weight, including a reduction in central obesity. But again, then again, one could argue that there was no placebo group in this trial, and whichever drug would improve blood glucose to some extent would possibly lead to an improvement in these parameters. So then again, there was another trial published another year back, 2019, where there was a head-to-head -head comparison. Both the groups had active drugs a carbose was compared with to metformin in patients with type 2 diabetes, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And several chronic inflammatory markers like interleukin 6, TNF alpha, other interleukins and ferritins were looked in. Now we know that metformin per se is an agent which has anti-inflammatory action, which has antioxidative action. So you were comparing a carbose to an agent which is known to reduce inflammation. Now, over the period of follow-up, it was found that metformin did reduce the inflammatory markers, but acarbose did it even better, which again proves the fact that acarbose has a significant anti-inflammatory effect. It could be because of reduction in postprandial hyperglycemia, reduction in postprandial hyperinsulinemia, increase in postprandial GLP-1 levels, alteration of gut microbiota, reduction in body weight and a number of mechanisms. But what has been seen time and again that chronic inflammatory markers as well as cardiovascular disease surrogate markers significantly reduce with the use of a carbose. But then again, we are more interested in hard events, cardiovascular disease rather than cardiovascular risk markers. So what about improvement in cardiovascular disease with the use of a carbose? There was a very interesting paper published earlier this year in 2021 called the Beijing Community Diabetes Study. In this study, about 1,800 adults were enrolled for analysis and followed up over a long period of about 10 years. In this 1,800 adult group, about 1,461 received the carbose, while the other part of 336 patients received other anti-diabetic agents but did not receive a carbose. Now, to cut a long story short, after the 10-year of follow-up, it was found that the ones receiving a carbose had a significant reduction in all-cause mortality, driven predominantly by a significant reduction in the incidence of myocardial infarction. Now, again, you could argue about myocardial infarction, whether it was long, wrongly labeled, but you cannot argue about all-cause death. That's a very, very hard event. There are no ifs and buts, no half deaths. So this was a study, although the numbers were small, but there was significant reduction in all-cause mortality and myocardial infarction when prospectively followed up in patients with diabetes who were put on a carbose. To look at the magnitude of the effect, when the confounders were removed, when a propensity match analysis was done, even then, the reduction in myocardial infarction and all-cause mortality was to the tune of around 50%. So there was robust benefit available from this data, although, as I would say, the only caveat is that the numbers in this trial were small. 
However, if you go back a little further in time, 2018, we have a trial where the numbers were huge. This was a study from a Taiwan database where nearly 15,000 patients on acarbos and other agents were compared to 15,000 patients on sulfonylurea and other agents. And this was a propensity matched analysis. Analysis of this observational data showed that over a period of around six to seven years of follow-up, use of acarbos significantly reduced the incidence of all atherosclerotic cardiovascular events, predominantly driven by a decrease in ischemic stroke leading to lesser hospitalization. So again, we have data where, where acarbos in the Beijing community study reduced all-cause mortality and myocardial infarction. And this is data from Taiwan where acarbos compared to sulfonylurea improved ischemic stroke and reduce the incidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If you look back at the STOP NIDDM trial pre-diabetes without heart disease, acarbos reduced the incidence of myocardial infarction. So the signals were already there. Even if you look at the ACE study where pre-diabetes with established coronary artery disease was included, use of acarbos did not increase the risk of cardiovascular events. So it actually reinforces our confidence in the fact that there could be possible cardiac benefits with the use of a carbose, if not definite benefits. And we can safely say that it does not increase the risk of cardiovascular disease per se. So to sum up what I have spoken over the last 17 to 18 minutes, we have new data which reinforces our belief in the fact that a carbose is not that any other, like any other AGI. It improves the postprandial incretin response. And earlier data also shows that it improves the gut microbiome in a good way. It has time and again proved its efficacy, not only in terms of reducing A1C, but also in terms of reducing glycemic variability. In addition to that, it reduces obesity, including central obesity. There are several studies which have shown that it improves chronic inflammatory markers, improves cardiovascular disease surrogate markers. But I think the icing on the cake are the two data that we got from the Taiwan study where there was a decrease in ischemic stroke and the Beijing study where there was a decrease in myocardial infarction and all cause mortality. So I think that it, it, a carbose is not an agent per se, which I would say uh, uh, would be the first line. First line would, of course, be metformin. But after metformin, when we think of adding a second drug, particularly the Indian setting where we take a lot of carbohydrates, Acarbose, I think, has an edge, particularly over the glyptins in terms of greater weight reduction and the possibility, I won't say there's a definite uh, indication, but a possibility of cardiovascular risk reduction, if not a definite cardiovascular risk reduction. So it is not only the recent past, I would say, but the near future, which is promising, there are at least a dozen more trials which are ongoing with acarbose, including a trial in gestational diabetes. So I would just like to sum up with the words like that, over the last couple of years, the data that I discussed has actually increased our confidence in the use of acarbos. As I said in the beginning, we cannot reinvent the wheel, but looking at the data that we have with acarbos, we can say with confidence that acarbos provides a safe set of wheels on the journey of diabetes to keep our patients healthy and sound. So thank you for your hearing. Back to Dr. Joshi.